Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Okay, so recently I took a look at Intel's latest Elder Lake CPUs in a sort of IPC benchmark where I locked the core count and frequency for an architectural comparison with previous generations, as well as CPU architectures from AMD. Now, admittedly, I did kind of lose focus there, and I feel the content did suffer a little bit because of it. I got too hung up on the e-cores, and unfortunately, upon reflection, I do feel as though I somewhat misrepresented them. I also made the mistake of not making it crystal clear from the outset that this was a for science type video, and not buying advice, and nothing shown in that video in any way changed our opinion of the various Elder Lake CPUs. All opinions and recommendations from my initial 12600K, 12700K, and 12900K product reviews still stood so that is to say, I very much like Intel's latest 12th gen series. So providing that disclaimer right off the bat would have helped clear the air, and ultimately I should have just kept things simple and stuck to testing the P cores for an IPC comparison, or at the very least focused more heavily on that configuration when discussing the results. All of that said, the previous video was actually well received for the most part with a 96% like ratio, generally positive feedback from you guys, and a lot of you were keen to see additional configurations tested, so that's always good to see. And that is what we'll be doing today. But there were those of you who thought that I did misrepresent the e-cores, and as I said, upon reflection, I happen to agree with you. I now feel it was a mistake to only test with either just four of them enabled, or two e-cores with two p-cores. The reason for this made sense at the time, after all I was going for an apples to apples configuration by normalizing the frequency and core count. But because I ended up focusing so much on how weak the e-cores were for gaming, I really needed to test more configurations, more realistic configurations, let's say, with up to eight e-cores enabled. So today I'm gonna to make amends and do exactly that. I should quickly note though that all of the data shown in the previous video is 100% accurate, but with more cores enabled, the reality of the situation isn't quite as bad as I portrayed, and in fact, often quite a bit better. I still feel as though gamers would be best served by replacing the 8 E cores of the 1200K, for example, with two extra P cores, but the situation with the E cores for gaming isn't as bad as I thought. I've also discovered a few interesting things along the way, so while I wasn't entirely pleased with the first video, it has at least motivated me to dig in a bit more and see what's going on. So for testing, I installed the Core i9 1200K in my MSI Z690 Tomahawk Wi Fi DDR4 test system with 16 gigabytes of DDR4-3600CL14 memory, and once again, I used an AMD Radeon RX 6900 XT graphics card. For the core configurations, I'm gonna be looking at two P cores with eight E cores, four P cores with no E cores, four P cores with eight E cores, and then six P cores with no E cores. I've also tested with both Windows 10 and Windows 11 after discovering some strange behavior in at least one game, and we'll take a look at that now. So I was really interested to see if the E cores performed just as poorly with more of them enabled, and if my opinion of just adding two more P cores for gaming was the right call. So I fired up one of the more CPU demanding games we know of, shut off the Tomb Raider, and got testing using Windows 11, which is the operating system Intel recommends for testing 12th gen CPUs. Right away, I was shocked to find an almost 60% performance increase when going from the 2P plus 8E configuration to just 4P cores. Then when moving to the 4P plus 8E configuration, performance was only slightly increased, while just 6P cores were 10% faster again, leading me to believe that I was right. E cores are horrible for gaming. But the results didn't really make sense, and while they did confirm what I had said in the original video, so that's great if I just wanted to be right, but that's not the goal here and the results did seem strange. So I took a closer look at how Shadow of the Tomb Raider was utilizing the cores and I quickly discovered the issue. The game was completely maxing out the two P cores along with their threads, but the eight E cores were left doing very little, resulting in a total CPU utilization of roughly 60%. So what was going on here? Well, the first thing I did to try and find out was to retest using Windows 10 and well, here are those results. Yeah, a very different looking graph, isn't it? Using Windows 10, we're looking at almost identical performance across the board. Doesn't really matter how the 1200K was configured, performance was much the same. And here's a look at utilization. We're now around 80% total CPU utilization. And as you can see, the e-cores are being worked much harder. Comparing the Windows 10 and Windows 11 data side by side, you can see just how broken the game is using Microsoft's latest operating system when limited to just a few p-cores. 
and the reason is entirely down to its refusal to use the eCores. Now I should mention at this point that all testing from the previous video was conducted using Windows 10, because again I wanted to make the data as apples to apples as I could, so this Windows 11 bug wasn't present in that testing. So is the Windows 11 scheduler just really dumb and avoids the eCores for gaming at all costs? Or is this issue limited to perhaps just a handful of games? To find out, I've tested five more titles, so let's move on to take a look at Rainbow Six Siege. Right away, you'll notice that Rainbow Six Siege doesn't have the eCore utilization issue with either operating system. And oddly, of the six games I tested, this was only present with Shadow of the Tomb Raider, which unfortunately was the first game I used to try and validate my theory. So we know never to rely on a single data set, but you have to start somewhere. And unfortunately, I did start with Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Interestingly, Windows 11 did provide consistently better results with up to 7% higher frame rates, but the performance margins were much the same. So that being the case, let's focus on the Windows 11 data in an effort to simplify the presentation. Now, if we compare the 2P plus 8 configuration to having just four P cores enabled, we find that with just the P cores active, performance is better. And this is what we repeatedly saw in the previous test. Here performance is up to 7% greater, and this does confirm, at least for Rainbow Six Siege, that the game would play better with additional P cores, though of course 6 to 8 is already plenty for this title, and it certainly doesn't require 10 P cores. But should future more demanding games scale in a similar fashion, the P cores would be of greater utility. Even when comparing the 4P plus 8E configuration to just 6 P cores, we find that with just the P cores active, performance is still up to 7% greater. It's also really interesting comparing 4P plus 8E to 4P plus 0E, as the configuration using no E cores was slightly faster. And this is despite the E cores being utilized. Presumably the slower processing of the E cores is at times stalling the processing pipeline. So the E cores in this example are hurting performance, but not by an extreme margin. And here's a quick side-by-side -side comparison of CPU utilization when running Rainbow Six Siege on Windows 10 and Windows 11. As you can see, utilization is very similar, though Windows 11 does more consistently hit the P cores, and this is why performance overall was slightly better. And this is how the Windows 11 scheduler should behave, not like what was seen in Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Moving on to Hitman 2, we again find very similar results between Windows 10 and 11, so that's good, though this time Windows 10 was consistently a smidgen faster. The performance variations between the various configurations are similar to what was also seen in Rainbow Six Siege, especially when looking at the 1% lows. Starting from the top this time, we see that the 6P cores are up to 8% faster than a 4P plus 8E configuration, and again, this is in line with the results just seen. We also find that 4P cores with no E cores is faster than 4P plus 8E, though only by a few percent, so really performance goes mostly unchanged here. So despite utilizing the E cores quite heavily, performance hasn't improved. Then when more heavily utilizing the cores by reducing their numbers, we see that 4P cores are up to 14% faster than 2P cores with 8E cores. And that's similar to the more extreme configurations I tested in the previous video, showing up to 20% margins. But what we have here are more realistic configurations. Now, if we look at the CPU utilization, we find something a bit unexpected. Despite slightly better frame rate performance with Windows 10, the utilization figures would suggest that that's gonna be unlikely. And this is because we see some small drop off with the P-Core utilization and overall CPU usage was at 90%, whereas Windows 11 typically hit 97% and had the P-Cores pegged at 100% for the duration of the test. So that's interesting, but as I've said countless times in the past, CPU usage should only be used as a rough guide as it's not always completely accurate and we don't know how the cores are being utilized. F1 2021 saw better 1% low performance for all testing configurations when using Windows 10, but overall performance was much the same due to a heavy GPU bottleneck. So not particularly useful for our case study, these results are still very interesting in their own right, as they very clearly highlight just how reliant most of today's games are on single thread performance. Whether you have two fast cores or six, it doesn't seem to matter much, and perhaps the E cores do pick up the slack here, given any slowdown is masked by the GPU bottleneck, or perhaps two P cores is more than enough processing power to run F1 2021. This is also why you'll often see little to no difference between a screaming fast CPU and a rather slow one when gaming at 4K. 
We see that performance is a bit all over the place between the two Microsoft operating systems in Horizon Zero Dawn, though Windows 10 was consistently faster. So that being the case, let's remove the Windows 11 data to simplify this graph. Okay, that's a bit clearer. Now, the first thing we see here is the fact that the P cores really are enough to run the game as adding another two does really nothing. And we again see that adding eight E cores slightly reduces performance overall, while four P cores is better than two P plus eight E, but because this isn't a very CPU demanding game, the margins are very small and not worth worrying about. Finally, we have Cyberpunk 2077, and despite using slightly dialed down quality settings with a 6900 XT at 1080p, the data is still heavily GPU limited, though the performance trends are similar to what we've seen in most other games. The margins are just smaller because, as I said, the game is GPU limited. So, using more realistic E core configurations, I've found the situation isn't quite as bad as I first thought, but it's still not highly positive either at least with today's games. It is possible future games could better leverage the e-cores, but unless AMD goes down a similar path, I don't see this happening beyond maybe a few outlier cases. It was disappointing to find that in situations like what was seen in Hitman 2 and Rainbow Six Siege, where four p-cores were 100% utilized, so completely maxed out, adding eight e-cores into the mix didn't improve performance, and in fact, we saw a performance decline in both of those scenarios. Moreover, in Hitman 2, four P cores with no E cores were up to 14% faster than two P cores with eight E cores, suggesting that adding more P cores in favor of the E cores, for gaming at least, would be of far greater benefit. So while I might have overstated just how bad the E cores are for gaming when used in conjunction with P cores, I wasn't miles off the mark. And for today's games, gamers are probably best off disabling the E cores altogether if they want to ensure maximum performance, or better yet, use a program like Process Lasso to force the game into looking only at the P cores. That said, parts like the 12600K that have 6 P cores, or the 12700K and 12900K that have 8, today's games shouldn't look at the E cores, and therefore the E core performance in games becomes a non-issue. But as I said previously, for gamers, the 12600K is really just a 6 core 12 thread processor, while the 12700K and 12900K are 8 core 16 thread processors. But even then, I really do hate to dumb this discussion down to core count, because as I've said many times in the past, cores ain't cores, and by that I mean the Elder Lake P cores are exceptionally powerful. So while I do believe that the 12900K should be viewed as an 8-core CPU by gamers, it's not a particularly useful measuring stick as performance is widely different to many other 8-core CPUs. For example, when compared to the 9900K, you're looking at over 20% greater core performance in games, or 30% more when compared to Zen 2 cores used in the current generation consoles, and that's assuming that they're matched at the same frequency. Moving on, something I saw a lot of in the comments section of the previous video were people parroting Intel's marketing material, claiming stuff like, of course e-cores are bad for gaming, that's not what they're designed for, they handle background tasks, freeing up the P cores to tackle gaming. That is utter nonsense. I, I mean, yes, this is ultimately what the e-cores are intended to do for gaming, but that's only because that's really all they can be used for. And as we've just seen, if used in conjunction with the p-cores for gaming, they only serve to reduce frame rates. This was very clearly highlighted in Hitman 2 and Rainbow Six Siege, for example. But the reason those claims are nonsense is because those background tasks can be taken care of by p-cores, and much more promptly I might add. So an additional two p-cores, which can fit in the same space as eight e-cores, would be better for gamers, as they'd be just as competent at handling background tasks if need be, and then miles better for gaming if called upon. It's also worth noting that most background tasks only present a very light CPU load, which is after all why they're considered to be background tasks. They also don't require a dedicated core, and I think this is one of the biggest misconceptions gamers have about how CPUs work. These background tasks can be quickly handled by any one p-core, and that p-core can be doing many different tasks at the same time, or virtually at the same time, and one p-core should be roughly equal to an entire e-core cluster for this workload. I'm also sure that someone will bring up streaming as being a background task, and that's a dubious claim in our opinion, as this is more of a foreground task run simultaneously with the game, and again, there is no evidence that 8 E cores would handle this load better than an additional 2 P cores. 
Now, the reason why Intel went with this hybrid design is because it does help with core heavy applications that don't rely heavily on core to core communication. In those scenarios, the E cores are more efficient. So if it was just about producing the highest Cinebench score, then yeah, Intel would be better off dedicating most of the silicon to E cores. But it has to be said, this hybrid approach does make Alder Lake more well-rounded when compared to past Intel architectures. The 11900K, for example, was quite good when it came to gaming, but was slaughtered by the Ryzen 9 processors when it came to core-heavy applications. And 12th Gen has been able to solve this with its use of E-Cores, making it, as I said, a more well-rounded product. So again, I need to reiterate that we're not saying there's anything wrong with Intel's 12th Gen series. And in a way, this is good news for upcoming Alder Lake CPUs. For example, the locked Core i5s, which are said to do away with the E-Cores, will be great options for gamers, because as we've found, those efficient cores do nothing for games. So without this information, some gamers might be hesitant to go with a 6-core 12-thread Alder Lake CPU, such as the locked Core i5s, over the 10-core 16-thread 12600K, but as we've found, they really shouldn't be. Also, because the P cores are so damn impressive in terms of performance, quad cores, like what we're expecting to see from the 12th gen Core i3 range, will be very capable gaming CPUs for those of you on a budget. Those parts are expected to house four P cores with no E cores, so a more traditional four core eight thread processor. And based on the data we've seen here, as we did test that configuration, well, a similar configuration should be very good. That is assuming that the smaller L3 cache of the Core i3 models doesn't hurt performance too much. As for Windows, we found another example where Windows 11 is a bit wonky with strange scheduling behavior and shut off the Tomb Raider. Not sure if Microsoft's to blame there or the game developer. But yeah, whatever the case is, the Windows does refuse to access the E cores with that particular title. This is likely just a bug with the game and I expect it will be addressed. So hopefully this testing did better address the whole E cores for gaming discussion. If you enjoyed this video, do hit the like button. You can also subscribe for more content. And if you'd like to support the Hubbard Box channel, get some cool perks in return, then check us out over at Patreon or Floatplane. Links for those are in the video description. You get access to our exclusive Discord server where I was going back and forth with a lot of you guys on this testing over the last few days. We also have a live stream that Tim and I get together and do and answer your questions live, a Q&A series and behind the scenes content. So if you guys are interested in that, check it out. As I said, links are in the video description. But if not, that is perfectly fine. And I would like to just thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.